murdered now long historically is now in luck and change the world forever. Fields propagated, as was hatred for Islam. And an astonishing exposure of lies, submissions and contradictions from the highest level of government. Such as Mr. Bin Laden's mates with standing eyes. Steel frame buildings apparently fragile. Frantic options trade in prize of the event. And building seven dropping to the floor <coughs> after the penthouse fell over and some desk caught fire. <laughs> Sorry. The Patriots are patiently waiting in an outrage for its signal. And uh, Larry Silverstein's no claims bonds. <laughs> and no doubt everybody else can have some to that. The determined, persistent and highly qualified Dr. Judy Wood has brought forth the evidence that the towers returned to dust in mid-air and then leaving a, re a relatively small debris pile. She also examines the strange Hutchison effect and its ability to alter and distort metals. Essentially, the similarities in the debris have been observed. Have her findings in pursuit of justice and truth been welcomed officially? <laughs> it's strange that some truth groups are skirting around the phenomenon, preferring the thermite theory. One actually had the power to turn massive structures to dust. The debunkers are out in force and some are quite convincing. The actual truth now is drawn by this and disinformation. The wars with civilian deaths in other countries continue as the suppressive le legislation on home soil. There we ask who might benefit. So just before I turn it over to the lady herself, I would really like to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rob, for that excellent introduction. You know, uh, I'm really glad to see the hall so full. Uh, it's a wonderful sort of, uh, sort of accolade, really. So thank you very much. And thanks to everyone who's come such a long way. Another book you might be interested in, which I haven't really spoken enough about, is Professor Eric Larson's um, The School of Yorick, the uh, emptiness of American thinking at a time of great peril. He writes about Dr. Judy Wood in his book from his perspective as well, uh, and that's available on the internet. It's not available in this country, but I think it's not too expensive to get hold of, so you might want to have a look at that. Um, so without further ado, I'd now like to pass over to Dr. Wood, and uh, she will um, carry on. And uh, we, we've prepared some of this short, again, short notice, so um, you know, uh, I hope you appreciate that. And uh, here we go. Thanks for being here. Well, I'm a bit overwhelmed to find so many people here wanting to hear what I have to say. It's wonderful. It's, it's truly wonderful. Thank you. So, the subject of the day, where did the towers go? Let's see. Well, once upon a time, there were two towers. Then they went away. That material there is all that was left of that building. That's building three. A lot of people overlooked that building. And this is the remains of tower two, about the lobby size down there. To remind you of how big of a mass was there. And then it is gone. This picture was taken on 9-11. Where is all the debris? Everybody wants to know who did it. They just have to know who did it. And so they jump to the conclusion, ah, but the planes did it. No, it was bombs in the building. No, it was thermite. And pretty soon there's just answers all over the place of, of what they think it could be. Spray on thermite, fourth generation, mini nukes. Just throwing out answers. You can't really find the answer that way. Because if you had uh, a dead body you came upon, how did it die? Well, we found a smoking gun. So now we know it had to be the gun that did it. But then it turns out uh, you found the dead body underneath the garage door. Ah, the garage door must have done it. Wait a minute, maybe he was poisoned. So guessing the answer with just a few details is not a good way to go. 
I don't know if many of you heard about this case that really was just oversaturated in our media. This case of uh, Casey Anthony, a mother accused of killing her child, and then was found not guilty because, and everyone was shocked, not everyone, but the people who were following the story were shocked. But the next day, Jennifer Ford, one of the jurors, um, getting feedback here, um, spoke uh, to the media saying they did not know how the child died. How can you convict somebody of a crime if you don't know what crime they even committed? The jury did not know what happened. So finding out what happened is the most important thing. Then you can determine how it happened, who was involved, why they did it. But what we're going to concentrate on, because it's the most important thing, is what happened. The main thing of what happened, the towers didn't burn up, nor did they slam to the ground. They turned into dust in midair. How do we know that? Wait, does that look like a collapse to you? We were told it was a collapse. We were, we were basically brainwashed into reacting to this picture, like flashcards. Memorize the word collapse when you see this. But that's not a collapse. If they had hit the ground, if they had slammed into the ground, there would be over a million tons of debris piled up on the ground. But that didn't happen. If they had slammed to the ground, Manhattan would have been flooded because the bathtub, which holds out the Hudson River, would have been ruptured. We'll talk about the bathtub a little bit more. And that didn't happen. And if they'd slammed to the ground, the seismic readings would have recorded two 500,000 ton buildings slamming to the ground, plus a 230,000 ton building slamming to the ground. And that didn't happen. So we first are going to determine what happened by looking at these three main areas. And then there's a whole host of other areas we'll look at as well. So here we have what was left after the towers went away. Only buildings with a WTC prefix were destroyed that day. Really, hardly anything else was even scratched. A few damaging things here and there, but nothing um, catastrophic that couldn't be repaired. That's all that was left of the North Tower. North Wall, the South Wall, and a little bit of Stairwell B. Now, the towers were steel structures with aluminum cladding on the outside. Well, you see a few pieces of aluminum cladding laying around. Yeah, you get a steel piece there. But right in front of the front door, why don't you have piles of steel structure? And there's this ambulance in pretty much pristine condition. Maybe the door got thrown a little bit. But I don't see any big piece of steel clobbering the top of it. And we know the park uh, ambulance is at ground level, not up in space. So that's ground level. Here's a newscast from the 24 uh, hours later. Down in Lower Manhattan today, George. I don't know if you heard a little earlier uh, me raise this question, which was asked, actually raised by ABC's Jackie Judd, as we look at these areas down below and the video of where the towers used to stand and where is all the rubble gone. And have you, have you been able to? And is there any way you can answer that question? I'm sorry, Peter, I didn't get the question. Okay, I apologize. Jackie Judd and several other people keep asking us, when you look at where the towers used to stand, there is surprisingly so little rubble. Where did all the rubble well, go? It's a very good question, Peter, and I have asked some people who've been doing some of the rescue and recovery work this morning. If you look behind me, you can see the very remains, the skeletal remains of the World Trade Center. 
and one volunteer, Robert Gerlinski, explained to me the reason there's so little rubble is that all of it simply fell down into the ground and was pulverized, evaporated. What was that that he said? <laughs> fell down to the ground, was pulverized and evaporated. I don't mean to be making fun of these people at all. They're trying to explain what they see. They don't see enough debris. And they're trying to come up with some explanation as to where the building went. Actually, that video clip I saw that day, and that partially inspired the title of the book. Because why do people quit asking that question? Here's another short clip the following day. I was astonished at the degree to which solid materials were turned into pulverized dust as a consequence of that building collapse. I think it was striking. People were shocked. It did not make sense how much it was turned to dust. The top view of the, what was left, we have building three here, tower one, tower two. Building six, it had all these cylindrical cutouts in it. Approximately the middle 50% of that building is missing. Building five had cylindrical cutouts in it. Some circular cutouts there. Building seven went missing. The buildings on either side weren't really destroyed much. There were some stab wounds, I call it, some pieces of steel beam that went into this building, but essentially nothing happened to this building. The sidewalk in front of it didn't even get covered. And building four, that's when it often gets forgotten. The north wing of it seemed to be sliced off like with an X-Acto knife and the main body of the building just went missing. Just the north wing stayed, or that part of the north wing. Here's that remaining stub of the north wing of building four. And looking at it directly on, here's what you would see. If you looked out of the, through the building across the street with binoculars, looked in, you could probably see what was left on someone's desk in there. Come to think of it, it reminded me of an image I saw as a child when my family drove through Topeka, Kansas the morning after that horrendous tornado that tore up a large par part of Topeka, Kansas. I remember seeing this apartment building, well, it was probably a dorm, but to a child it was an apartment building, sliced in two. Half of it was just gone, and the other half, like nothing happened. The bed was still made, magazines on the bedspread, some books on the dresser, and clothes hanging in the closet that did not look disturbed. No support under that floor, so I really don't think somebody w walked in there and made the bed. It's just unsupported hanging there. And it also might remind you of the Pentagon. It's a clean slice. From ground level, here's what it looked like that day. There's just this little corner left. And after they cleaned up the corner, there is that sliced off part of the north wing. So here is what was left, this elevation map, but there's what should have been there, that ghost pattern. And if you notice, there's a little pimple down there at the bottom of building three. Fourteen folks survived down there. The rest of the building went away and who was left in that little quarter there survived. Also, the bottom of Tower 1, that little hump there, that was Stairwell B. Fourteen people survived there as well. And one of them, when they came out, said this. I looked and said, guys, there used to be 106 floors above us, and now I'm seeing sunshine. There's nothing above us. That big building doesn't exist. These are the biggest office buildings in the world, and I didn't see one desk or one chair, or one phone, nothing. Another one talked about walking out onto an empty football field. Something I've often talked about is toilets. There should be at least 3,000 toilets in those buildings. Busted up toilets are easy to recognize. Recognizable parts, so you have all this gray dust, you should have some nice shiny sections of porcelain. 
assuming that is what they used. But you didn't see any. Not one bit. Again, here's the uh, cutout part of Building 6 and those other cylindrical holes. We're going to concentrate on the main body of Building 4 for, for a minute. Because it's fascinating the way it just went missing. Here's an actual photograph of that area. Here's that tiny little corner, but the rest of it just went missing. There's a Burger King across the street. They were still flipping burgers over there, <laughs> feeding the firefighters. The irony is just amazing. And right across the street from there, there was round holes in those windows. We'll see the pictures later. A rock goes through a window, it breaks the window, a baseball goes through the window, it shatters the window. It doesn't make a perfectly round hole. Again, this is the elevation map. And right there, I found a picture just below ground where it, from the mall. There was a mall, the first level below ground. And then two more stories below that was the loading docks. And we'll also look at that. It was this shape, the, uh, the drive in here, and it was color coded. This area is purple to let the driver know he's under building five, and it was green under building four, so they would know where to park. And we're going to look down this way and see this intact end of that parking garage. Here they are walking one story below ground. This is innovation luggage and this is Hallmark cards. A little bit punched through over here, but it didn't go much below this level. This is down in the parking garage. Going down to the parking garage. We're in quite deep. These are the first pictures of search crews underneath the World Trade Center desperately looking for survivors. That wasn't necessarily this area, but you hear that echo? Someone down there? You know, the echoes. That wasn't even a full parking garage. That echo was tremendous. So, again, the purple is under building five, green is under building four. Right above the end of that hallway is where that building went missing. Where'd it go? Mind you, that was also the location where the top of Tower 2 was tipping over and then it turned to dust, that's where it would have fallen. If the top 35 floors of Tower 2 had fallen to the ground, landed on Building 4, would it have looked like that? Now we're looking back from between Building 4 and 5 through the complex. There still well be where those folks survived, those 14 people who thought that when the building came apart, they thought they were so buried it would be forever till they could get to them and they'd be dead before workers could pull the rubble off of them. But then the dust cleared and they looked up at blue sky. There would be over a million tons of debris piled on the ground if those towers had slammed to the ground. Didn't happen. Looking from 180 degrees on the other side, again, here's stairwell B, the north and south facade. Where's the debris? There is some, okay, you got a few pieces of stuff here and there, but it's not the, anywhere near the amount to explain two 110-story buildings and the 22-story building. Where'd it go? One of the other um, folks who were trapped in stairwell B was calling out to be rescued and saying, uh, his buddies would call back and say, where are you? He said, stairwell B, tower one. Where? Tower one, stairwell B. Where are you? Stairwell B, tower one. It's, you know, like, what, what, why aren't you listening? And then the boys said, um, where's tower one? Or is the north tower? From the outside, you would wonder too. Mm -hmm. 
They were right in this little spot there. And they walked out. Once the dust cleared and they could see where they were going. Here's stairwell B in this area. There's the north wall of the north tower. This is a building six with the big gaping <coughs> hole in the middle. It's an eight story building. What remains of the north wall of tower one is about eight stories. Um, that was a 110 story building. So where are the other 102 stories of just the north wall? Not to mention what goes inside. And you can see over here where building seven had stood, it didn't even spill completely across that street onto the sidewalk. The post office, the wall, doesn't look like uh, stuff hit it. it. Doesn't look like a machine gun fired at it. If you're squashing down a 47-story building, that material has got to go somewhere. And it would be shot at, in order to get it smushed to the ground that amount of time, the material has to be launched out of there like Mach 1. But uh, that doesn't look like a machine gun hit it. Here's another image. Stairwell B, north wall. And here we have the bathtub wall. We haven't talked about that yet. The bathtub held out the Hudson River and this building was very close to that wall. It's like having it next to a, a dike. If that building had slammed to the ground, it would have damaged that bathtub, ruptured it, and flooded Manhattan. Well, let's talk about what the bathtub is. Before, when the towers were first built, there was just the towers out there. They were built on bedrock 70 feet below the water table. And they extended out, you know, wanting to uh, get more real estate on Manhattan. And they, later they built more buildings out, but it was right at water level. And so there was this wall that kept the Hudson River from flowing in. Manhattan would have been flooded if that crashed to the ground. Here we're looking down 70 feet below the water table onto that bedrock. There's the bathtub wall. Here's the west side. The old shoreline used to be right about here. There's a map of it. There's the old shoreline. They basically built the towers in the Hudson River and built this dike all the way around. They called it bathtub wall, or sometimes they call it the slurry wall. In the early 1900s, as you can see, uh, 1909, they finished the path train station and the subway would go underneath the Hudson River came up, turned around there, and went back out. When they built the towers, they relocated inside this bathtub. And then you had the intersection with the uh, subways that went around Manhattan. This is all below the water table. So if you broke that bathtub wall, subways would be flooded. All of lower Manhattan would really be destroyed. Another image of it, and they're starting to build out and extend out here, which they later did and built the WFC buildings. And again, you can see down deep into the basement. And another image, you can see right here is the old shoreline. And they extended out from there. And after 9-11, they cleaned out the debris. Voila, a clean bathtub. I'm not saying there was zero damage, but there was no significant damage. There was water hoses being poured all over the, the quote, pile, <laughs> over the uh, debris field here. And it ran down into the tunnels. Here's a tunnel opening. And they were worried for a bit to see if it was leaking. But once they pumped it dry, it stayed dry. It was not damaged. And a view looking west. This is the new buildings they built when they extended it out further. This is the footprint of Tower One, right here, right up against that wall. If that tower had fallen over, crashed down, whatever, if it had slammed to the ground any which way, it would have ruptured that bathtub wall. Mind you, that's an old wall. 
Now let's look at that third issue, the seismic impact. First of all, if you drop a bowling ball off the roof of the North Tower, without even considering air resistance, it's going to take 9.2 seconds to reach the bottom. This is time, and this is height. So here's the blue billiard ball. As you drop it down, of course it goes faster per time. It's going to take a little over 9 seconds to hit the ground. That's a billiard ball with no resistance. But imagine if one floor has to fall and hit the next floor to hit the next floor and so forth. Just looking at the timing. Well, as we saw, each time it hit, it turned to dust. There's all this dust pouring out. So looking at that timing, well, the building's damaged, so therefore it went faster. Let's overestimate the damage, well overestimate the damage. Let's say nine out of every ten floors is hollow, it is missing. So the, fir the first floor will fall ten stories before it hits the next one. But as soon as it hits, it turns to dust. And then, but let's assume it has enough energy to get the next one started. It doesn't, but let's assume it does. Then that one has to wait until the blue ball gets there to start that one going. And even at that, it's over 30 seconds. Imagine if it was every single floor, well over 100 seconds. But it takes time to put things in a trash compactor. Trash compactors don't work instantly to squash material. But even more interesting is uh, the length of time. It took eight seconds that the ground shook. How does that work? Only eight seconds the ground shook. If you get something you're hammering down, the ground should be shaken a good bit of that time. Even more noticeable, it's missing uh, anything beforehand. The seismic recordings would have reflected two 500,000 ton buildings slamming to the ground, but they did not. It didn't happen. One of the uh, emergency workers, one of the first responders, made this comment. I don't remember the sound of the building hitting the ground. Somebody told me that it measured on the Richter scale. I don't know how true that is. Because if a building is hitting the ground that hard, how do I not remember the sound of it? Buildings silently hitting the ground? Uh, I guess uh, this part of the building doesn't make a thud when it hits. The building is completely turned to dust or near completely turned to dust. It's not going to make a thud. It comes down like snow. In controlled demolitions, when a building slams the ground, that's when it is broken up and that's when the dust is created. This is an earthquake that was in Manhattan in January of that year on the same bedrock. It was in Midtown Manhattan. So we can test how that bedrock carries a signal. How does this look compared to that other chart? This has a whole lot more high frequency waves, a whole lot more uh, going on. That other one looks like it's over filtered or so, you know, something's weird about it, but worse than that, look at this. I, I call this the nozzle kind of leading up to the big signal. This is when the P wave arrives, the primary wave and then the secondary wave. And you can tell how far away an earthquake is by the delay of those. If it travels through the ground. If it doesn't travel through the ground, you don't get S wave and P waves. You only get surface waves. Now, let's look at the signal from Tower 1. No S wave and P wave arrival. Only surface waves. And look how much smoother it is. It's not that high frequency kind of rattling look. And it's approximately the same magnitude. This is a 2.3 instead of a 2.4. So we know that bedrock can transfer uh, seismic signals. So let's compare it to, well, first let's look at um, 
And Tower 2 had already gone by that point, but Tower 1, that's what it looked like on the overall scale. So 2.3. It should have been more, uh, much higher number. And then all afternoon there were still these uh, quarry blasts in New Jersey and in Pennsylvania that measured on the Richter scale. So we know that, that uh, the seismic charts were working. And then the Fox Islands, there was an earthquake there. But just before that earthquake, Building 7 went away, dropped and turned to dust, for its final demise. But what was most striking about that is that little red vertical line, that's when it happened. And there's nothing really that stands out and apart from background noise. Where's the signal for Building 7? It should be at least this. The Seattle Kingdom was a controlled demolition. So let's analyze that. It's got a whole lot of data out there is the reason why I used it. Notice that the dust doesn't rise much above the highest point of the building. And afterwards, there's stuff left over. These are people down here, these little specks. So that's a lot of material that's left, and you can recognize what it used to be. And this is the signal it leaves. Notice it has an S wave and a P wave arrival. And it lasts like 52 seconds for the majority of it. If you dropped a bowling ball off the roof of the kingdom, it would take about 3.9 seconds to hit the pavement below. It's a lot shorter. So we're just going to use that for a way to compare the length of signals. So let's average it to four seconds. But the major part of the ground shaking was nine <coughs> seconds. There's a lot more that shook after that, as the pile was probably readjusting and things were happening. And what was also interesting is the Seattle Times said, my gosh, it, it, the dust was in the air for almost 20 minutes. Uh, not 99 days. Here's the seismic signals from five different recording stations for Building 7. If you're real creative, you can pick out something from background noise, but not much. This station, nobody could pick anything out from background noise. Now, they calculated when the S and, and P waves were to arrive. They calculated that, but you don't see anything happening there. Just a hint of some disturbance in the surface wave. But again, this station, they couldn't even guess. Now, this building is, has six times, or had six times the potential energy of the kingdom. It should have at least registered the same as the kingdom on the Richter scale, which was a 2.3, like building one registered. Building one was 30 times the potential energy. <clears throat> so here's the kingdom. We'll look at things relative to the other towers with that. If you turned all but the bottom 20 stories to dust of Tower 1, you would get approximately that seismic signal that we saw. Uh, not without the SMP wave, but the, the magnitude. And for the South Tower, if you dustified all but the bottom 16 stories, that would explain why we only had a 2.1 on the Richter scale. For building seven, that 0 0.6 on the Richter scale is like the bottom two and a half stories falling to the ground, just about nothing. With the new phenomenon, we need a new word to describe it. Because using a known term for a known phenomenon that doesn't apply to a new phenomenon is not scientific. For what happened to the towers, I've used the word dustification. I think it's pretty clear what it means. It's a new phenomenon. We haven't seen a building get dustified before. So if we're, just pretend for argument's sake, a collapse of some sort, whether it's a uh, you know, pancake collapse, whatnot. Uh, bombs, bombs have to shoot stuff out at a high speed. 
The point is, if this building is to get to the ground in nine seconds, the material in this region has to go somewhere, has to shoot out at a tremendous speed. As it turns out, around Mach 1, depends on if you use eight seconds of the ground shook or nine seconds we calculate it would take. That's what the two differences are. If it was the eight seconds, somewhere around this level, it would exceed Mach 1, the average speed the stuff would have to shoot out of the building at. Up here, just right at the top of the building, it would already be exceeding Category 5 hurricane strength, the air pushing out of the building. And the center air traveling out would exceed Mach 2.5, somewhere near the bottom. So with this stuff, like somebody's Coke can on the windowsill, it's going to get launched at a tremendous speed and hit all of the adjacent buildings. It would be like a machine gun fire. That didn't happen. Only one uh, explanation I can think of would explain that. The building turned to dust. Another interesting phenomenon. This is building two being turned to dust. The top tips over, shrinks up before the rest starts down. It even looks like this is tipping over and then tips back a little bit. Many folks have probably seen that video. It looks like it um, violates the laws of conservation of momentum, but it doesn't necessarily. It does for a rigid body, but it's not a rigid body anymore. If the thing starts rotating and appears to stop rotating, but each of the little specks in it are rotating locally, it can maintain conservation of momentum not break the laws of physics. So it implies that the top was turned to dust. And sure enough, I mean, the rest of the building is still standing here, but this turns to dust first. Which adds to another question. If before the tower gets destroyed, you have the same stress across here. If it tips, you have less stress on this back corner. You've unloaded the building. This building here is used to carrying a bunch of weight on it, and you've taken that weight off. Why is it going to collapse? Now, <laughs> yeah, I've called this phenomenon Alka-Seltzer. An Alka-Seltzer tablet, take it out of the package, and it's dry and it'll stay looking the same, won't really change much, until you change its environment. If you drop it in a glass of water, it effervesces and dissolves. If you change its environment. This is steel. Steel usually doesn't uh, have dust shooting out the back of it. Perhaps its environment changed. And I'll point out, these are the pieces of aluminum cladding they don't look as affected. But this steel, I call these wheat checks. Uh, one of the photographers called it that, and they look like wheat checks. What, you call them shreddies here? Yeah. That uh, they're three columns wide, three stories tall. They're prefabricated um, at, the, at the shop and then hauled out to the building and put in place, prefabricated. So when the building came apart, it fell apart in those <coughs> prefabricated chunks. So here's a wheat check falling to the ground. Turns out it never reached the ground. Turned to dust first. Here's a slow motion image of these pieces coming down. And a little bit uh, into it, you'll see a piece falling down this corner in front of it. That's the corner of Vesey Street and West Street. This is the one coming here. Yeah, you see this like a stick. Mm -hmm. Keep watching it. It turns to dust. 
In a minute, we're going to look down that intersection where this stuff should have landed. I have a faster one of this, but notice how all this is trailing dust. That's not from a dirty windowsill. Here's the faster one. It'll play a few times. You also see things squirting out as the, it moves down. But this piece is quite interesting how it turns dust. And this is the Verizon building. And we're looking at the intersection as West Street goes that way and Vesey Street goes this other way. And here's where it should have landed. This is right after the destruction of Tower One. These people were in their hiding places, apparently, and they've come out of their hiding places. Look at the body language. Hands at the side, hands on the hips, arms folded, arms at the sides. They're shocked. There should be a big building right there. Paper and dust. Yeah, there's a piece of aluminum cladding there, but I think there should be a little bit more material. We were looking down here from A1, from that direction. In this picture over here, we're looking from A2. That's the same intersection. There was just a sea of unburned paper and dust. And then this car park went into spontaneous combustion. It appeared to go into spontaneous combustion. So don't make any assumptions. We don't know what was happening, but you can see orange looking, what looks like flames, something glowing in there. Now we're going to look from B1 and B2 positions as well as from C at what's referred to as the spire. There's that clump of core columns from Tower 1 that seems to remain just a little bit after the rest and then turns to dust. I'm sort of expecting that that is, or suspicious that that is right above where those 14 people survived who thought they would have been crushed and looked up and saw blue sky. Here's Tower 1 coming apart and it peels away like peeling a banana and left with these little, little spires sticking up. That's about 700 feet tall. It's got to be pretty strong to be standing unsupported that tall. Here's Building 7, which is a 47-story building. It's like 650 feet tall, approximately. This has got to be over that. And here's a closer view. And then it starts to drop down and kind of faints. Mm -hmm. Turns to dust. Now, if that thing tipped over, it, it would take out a few blocks worth of buildings. How's it going to go straight down? You got a 700-foot hole in the ground to drop it into? Okay, for argument's sake, let's, let's pretend we do have a 700-foot hole we're going to drop it into. And you're saying that that's uh, dust that shook off it that settled back here? That's blue sky around that. That's not dust gradually settling. If dust is that fine to hang in the air, it, it wouldn't be settled on it in that amount of time. So we know it doesn't have much time at all for dust to settle on it. And right after that, here it is from a slightly different angle. It'll just faint. Just faints and dustifies. Pretty neat trick. Now we're going to look at still frames from yet a different position. Remember it peels away like a banana, leaves it exposed. Blue sky, crisp edges. That's not dust settling on it. And then it comes to the point where it no longer has crisp edges and dustifies. Now we're going to look at it from across the river, yet a different angle. 
you can see it turning to dust. You know, it isn't tipping over in any particular direction. Oh, let me back up on that one. Oops, I backed up too fast. Okay. See how the dust cloud is sort of wrapping around this building? It's a little bit more wrapped around. So you can tell there's not much time has passed between those two images. Another one of my terms is lather. I like lather in a shower, but you're not going to confuse that with what happened on 9-11. <laughs> but it's a familiar word. It's a lot easier to remember than characteristic 2579-7A. So it's actually more scientific than an arbitrary term like that because you can identify it. Didn't it look like that Alka-Seltzer effect that was lather kind of pouring out? Well, it turns out the building's lathered up too. from ground to roof, one side and one side only. Not only that, this is building seven, the north face, and we have uh, busted out windows, but the, the fumes don't want to come out there. I'm just using fumes as generic, not saying smoke. We don't know what this is, but from ground to roof. And the wind that day was only like seven, eight to, or eight miles per hour. So it wasn't a stiff breeze. And you can see that by some wafting out in the space. No, no. Go low to the corner. Oh. Doesn't come out this window. Comes out that one, but, but uh, comes out this one down here, but not up there. It's very energized. If it was uh, smoke from a fire inside, first of all, it wouldn't come out of the entire face of the building. And second of all, you have a bottleneck there. It goes for the path of least resistance. And you'd have something coming out there. It's not pushing out. It's being sucked out, it looks like. We don't need to know what caused it to just be able to observe what's happening. That does not look like a fire pouring out a window. And that poured out of the building all afternoon for seven hours. That's a lot of material. Maybe that has to do with why it didn't make a thud when it hit the ground. So we're going to talk about the dust rollout. It's another interesting issue. This guy's running down the street, dust cloud chasing him. A wall of dust. A wall of dust? If, if junk slammed to the ground, the dust rolls out from the ground. It doesn't come as a wall. Now, I saw this, it kind of made me think of getting the, the whole building, grinding it up and turning it into dust within some like glass walls. So you have all this froth in there and then you take away the sideboards and let it just move outward, like it was already turned to dust before it was cut loose. And as it went down the street, it ran over people, didn't even burn, just left them covered with dust. This one is uh, particularly interesting, the contrast, whitehead. But uh, these people were hit with dust, like you can see where his tie had been. The dust rolled a particular distance and then went up. Bob and Bree were in that apartment there and it was wonderful of them to have shared their video. They took a video of this dust cloud rolling out. It didn't quite touch their window and went up. Never touched the window, like within an inch or two. It was amazing. Oh my god! 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 I told you! Oh my god! All these people! Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh, it's awful. Oh baby, hold Lily. 
Oh my god. Come on, let's go to the other room. Yeah. Oh, is this dangerous? I think it's just, I think it's just smoke. Is the air conditioner turned off in the room? And the, and the windows closed in the People bedroom? near the area are in an absolute crazy situation. The entire top of the building just collapsed. The entire building, the building just collapsed. Building, just collapsed. building just collapsed. We're going to leave because the smoke is coming right at us. Obviously, this is a devastating fall in our history. They're gone. The World Trade Center is, is no more. We do not know at this point uh, the extent of injuries or casualties. Uh, how many people were in these buildings trying to get out? We've seen some gut wrenches. Oh, people are running away. They're running away. What are they going to do? You guys got to yeah, run away. You see the obvious. Look at the right now. I think it's, it's going to be blown away from this. No, no, it's the wind is being blown away. Horrific, incredible. Not to be really Tuesday morning. We were looking at live pictures of the World Trade Center where just a few minutes ago, within the last minute actually, the second twin tower collapsed. Just to recap, if you're just joining us around 8.42 Eastern time this morning here in New York City, a plane crashed into the right twin tower of the World Trade Center about two feet of the way up the building, leaving a huge gaping hole, a huge fire and tons of billowing smoke. About 25 minutes later, a second jet, believed to be a 727 or a 737, then crashed from the second twin. All these people running away. But the dust rolls out a particular distance. What would explain that? Well, I'm thinking if you throw rocks, they go pretty big distance. If you throw flour, dust, it doesn't go very far at all because it has a lot of surface area per mass, a lot of wind resistance, so dust doesn't go very far. But if you throw rocks and they become dust in midair, at a particular rate, they'll reach maximum distance and stop going up. I mean, stop going out, and then if they're fine enough, they'll start going up. This dust went up. You can imagine people who were down in this area, total blackout. 100% of the sunlight was blocked out. This is a view, a couple of the um, frames from their video. You can see the dust rising. It was, rose like he spread. It never hit their window. This rose up. Really spooky looking. And other types of things kept breaking down and rising up. Here's water being misted onto what was left of ground zero, <laughs> what was left of the debris field. And they brought in wet dirt, dumped it on it. This was Halloween, like six weeks later, after 9-11. This isn't fire. That's not what fire does. Wet dirt, dirt tracks. Also, if it were hot, you wouldn't put your uh, hydraulic equipment out there. Hydraulics uh, have per permanent damage if operated above like 82 centigrade. But that dust went up, or whatever it was, that, those fumes, I call it fumes just generically, like it was on a mission to go up. It almost looks like a funnel cloud. Dark stuff went westward. The whitish stuff went south and up to a certain altitude and then sort of wafts away. This is a close-up of that. <coughs> then we have the toasted cars. This one was over on FDR Drive. Nice, healthy-looking tire. Uh, not so healthy-looking window trim. What happened to that car? We don't know where it was damaged, but there's a whole lot of them over here on FDR Drive, which is the opposite side from where the towers are located on Manhattan. And to get, give a little uh, closer look here, we're going to look at both sides. This is the right side of this police car. You have a very abrupt boundary 
between the toasted area and the not toasted area. By toasted, I'm not implying cause. It doesn't mean that it was burnt. Toast, it's history. You use that term here? It's toast. You, you can't fix it, you have to buy a new one, or you can't repair it. So this is, something happened to this. The plastic lights on top, they didn't get cooked. So it doesn't appear to have been heat related. And the inside is very toasted all the way inside the door, but for some reason that from here back is not toasted. And looking at the other side of the car, it has a spot that's not toasted. Here's a closer up view of it. Abrupt, like uh, it had a mask over it in the dark room. One part was exposed and one part wasn't. But wait a minute, fire doesn't work like that. Fire, you have, you have the burnt area, the not burnt area, and then a transition in between, like black and white and shades of gray. You don't have totally toasted, not toasted at all, one nanometer away from that boundary. Again, nice back tire. And the trunk lids popped up. I noticed that pattern as though the material that uh, latches the doors is one of the easiest materials to get destroyed. And it does seem material specific. In the center of where the towers were destroyed, like everything pretty much was, but as you move outward, things that are just partially affected. You know, what gets affected first? There's another interesting thing. I know uh, Andrew's talked about this. The upside down cars. I remember when I first showed Andrew this picture, I said, Andrew, why is the car upside down? Why is it parked upside down? Got trees over there. I swore. <laughs> what? I swore at that. <laughs> <laughs> And this uh, police car here, but notice the upside down ones aren't as toasted on the bottom. It's like they either get toasted or they get flipped. You get some interesting tires sticking up in the air there, like it did a face plant in the street. And here's a, that night. And you said you saw melted tour buses, melted cars? The cars that were right down there, it was just unbelievable. They were twisted and melted into nothing. The, build, the debris is just unbelievable. And then you can see fire trucks and police vehicles that were down there early, that um, all their windows, the windshields are completely blown out from, must have been from when debris dropped. But even more jarring, I think, uh, is this scene right here. Look at these two cars placed on top of one another. I think when you, when you think about the impact that uh, these planes must have had, it's hard to, to visualize um, it because everything melted. But here, at least you have some remnants. You have literally an engine uh, that is melded together with other parts of the car. Moving over, you've got another car they moved here. It looks like it's been through a war. Uh, you can see uh, the papers, all the, uh, the burned out papers from the building. You see the soot and the dirt. And it just shows you how devastating this blast was. Look across the street there. Uh, you've got a Con Ed uh, truck that you know, some of the Con Ed people now looking at, examining, trying to figure out uh, which truck that actually was. But that truck, too, uh, in terrible shape. Uh, so while many of the uh, items, the steel, uh, was literally melted, People who have been right down next to the base of what was the Trade Towers say there's virtually nothing left. Maybe a few flights of stairs, a few uh, stories of one of the buildings, but that when they came down there was so much melting and so much demolishing of any kind of structure that they cannot imagine uh, much being left or much hope of finding anybody alive. Uh, uh, now, why did they have, um, why was it melted? But none of the people walking around there were burnt. None of the paper was burned. Well, very little of the paper was burned. A lot of unburned paper. So I think we need to take a break now. Is that the idea? Yeah. Yeah. This is a good place to stop. <laughs>